Good morning and welcome to Cornerstone. If you could please find your seats, it's time for the morning announcements. If this is your first or second time here, please meet us at the Guest Center. It's directly out the back doors of the auditorium. We'd love to meet you and get to know you better. Thank you. Here at Cornerstone, we love God and we love others, and one of the ways we can do that is through our giving. If you would like to give, you can do so through the Church Center app or one of the giving boxes located at the back of the auditorium. Because, because you, you give, give, we, we can, can serve. serve. This Wednesday, there's men's and women's groups at 7 p.m. There will also be youth and kids as well. If you would like to get baptized, we will be having a water baptism service on May 7th. For more information, talk to Pastor Kermit. Breakaway Teen Camp is coming up. It's July 17th through the 21st. Sign up is due by May 21st so that we can know how many people we're bringing, get a group number, and then you can register on the ISM website. Your kid is going to have an amazing time. Make sure they go. And that's it for your morning announcements. For more information and to stay up to date with what's going on here at Cornerstone, you can always check out the paper bulletin or the Church Center app. We love Love you. you. Have Have an amazing amazing day. day. Good morning, Cornerstone. How are we today? Would you stand as you are able? We're going to worship together in spirit and in truth and in freedom. So let's sing together. the world, but it couldn't fill me, man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough, then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Come on, we sing this out. There's nothing better. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is.
Be a house where you 
the power of your presence that changes us because it means that we know we have to be changed, that we know that there's something that's just not quite right, that there's something fundamental that has to be shifted. You know, and we're gonna sing this next song called Build My Life. And Jesus tells us in Luke chapter six that the only way to build our life to build our life upon him is to listen and to obey his word. Not to just listen and hear, but to listen and to obey. And so for some of us, there's things that the Lord is speaking to us, things that we know that maybe we've been just kind of pushing off. And he's saying, but to build your house upon me, to be a firm foundation, you need to listen and to obey. Because when we do that, when we experience, we, we talked about how there's nothing better than him. If there's nothing better than his presence. If there's nothing better than Jesus, then it doesn't mean much to obey him. It doesn't, it doesn't have to hurt us because he, he's, there's nothing better than him. He's the best. So as we sing this next song, let's reflect on what we need to listen and to obey today? What is the Lord saying to us and what do we need to act or to move on? Come on, we sing worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever the only one who could ever say He's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you
will come, the winds will blow. But you're here, you won't be shaken. You won't be shaken. I will build, I will build, and I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in. shifting sand of this culture or another relationship or uh, any other temporary thing. We want to look to you today. And so, Father, uh, maybe today we just need to be reminded of that. Maybe we've come into this place and we've been striving and we've been trying to to establish a, a firm foundation in some other thing. God, I pray that as we've sung this song today and we've gathered here, I pray that we would be reminded anew of the fact that you are our source and you are our help and you are our strength. Father, I pray that we would look to you. I pray that we would see you um, at the center of everything. We would commit ourselves to following after you. And God, we recognize that following after you means letting go of other things. It means uh, casting aside distractions. And so, Father, I pray that even, even now as your spirit is speaking to each one of us, I pray if there are things in our life that we recognize we need to let go of, I pray that you would give us the clarity to do that, to recommit ourselves to following after you. So, Lord, as we've spent this time in worship and as we move into a time of looking at your word, we pray as we do each week, would you challenge us and change us and convict us? because we don't want to be the same. We want to be more and more like you, more and more the people that you've called us to be. So do that work in our hearts today. You've begun it here in this time of worship. We wanna continue to be transformed through the time of your word. And then as we go from this place, eventually we wanna walk in your way and in your truth and share that with the world around us. So help us to do that, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you, you can take a seat. It's great to see each of you here today. Thanks, Pastor Abby and our worship team for leading us. 
I'm grateful. I'm so grateful for, um, you know, all of the different people that help. I mean, the donut people. Come on, the Schultzes were out there today. Somebody give it up for the donut people. All right, we got our greeters. There's all sorts of things that are going on around here. Thank you so much. Uh, to each of you, our sound and tech teams and security and all those things. Well, my name's Eric. I'm the pastor here at Cornerstone. It is so great to see each of you uh, here. If you're new to the church, uh, just stop by the new here area right outside the, these doors. And uh, Pastor Kermit or myself or one of us will connect with you. We want to get to know you and just see how we can come alongside of you and minister to you and uh, to your family. Well, uh, this past week was a, a, a kind of a busy week for the church. We had a couple of different uh, ministries that we were connected with and outreaches that we were involved with. On Tuesday of this past week, uh, we took our inflatables over to the uh, Central Park over in Bethalto, and, here in Bethalto, and we were a part of the school community night, and we provided the bouncers for that. So several of you helped uh, unroll the bouncers and then roll them back up and then uh, you know manage those, and so we thank you so much for doing that. And then on Thursday, here in our building, we hosted Restore. Restore Network. Restore Network is a organization, uh, a local organization that we partner with that does work with uh, foster care families. And so there were several families here. Uh, the, the foster parents were upstairs in our Ferguson room and they were getting training and learning. And then the kids were down uh, in the kids area. And I've, I was helping with that. And, you know, look, let me, let me just say, we need some help <laughs> helping with the kids. Uh, it's a little crazy in there. And I'll just be honest, uh, it is hard. But it is rewarding. And uh, if you would like to figure out, they're here once a month uh, and they use our building and uh, we could use a few more hands. If you're available, uh, come and find me and I will connect you with the right individual to, uh, to get you signed up. But I, I mention these things because I want to remind us that our responsibility as a church isn't just what happens here. Uh, in our services. I mean, this is very important, but what we do here should, should translate into something that takes place outside of these walls as well. And so um, we do those kinds of things throughout the week. And as we say each week, because you give, we can serve. So when you're faithful to give the Lord his tithe and you give above and beyond the kingdom builders, you're making a difference in our community. And so thank you so much for doing that. Well, have you ever thought this uh, phrase or this question, I miss the good old days. Anybody ever thought that before? Like, oh man, I miss the good old days. Now, uh, some of you might be looking at me and saying, Pastor Eric, you're too young to be missing some good old days. But I look back at my youth and uh, I think, man, I miss when things were like that. You know, we, uh, I think we've all felt that way to one extent or another. We look back at the time when things were more simple, when we had less responsibility, when things were easier, when, when everything seemed to be a little bit more innocent, maybe. Or maybe we just think you know, life was easier back then. Um, on the show, The Office, Andy Bernard, his character, uh, puts it well. He says, I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. It's a great line from Andy Bernard on The Office. It's because, you know, once you've left them, you can't go back. You can't do much about it. And I think this longing that we have for better days, it comes from a discontentment with where we're at today. We, we look around us at this world and we realize that the world is less than ideal. Uh, we struggle to keep pace with ever-changing technology and culture. We face increasingly difficult challenges socially, economically. And let's just be honest, some of us, we're just getting older, and, uh, and, and we just long for those days of our youth. And, and the truth is, is that the good old days, they really probably weren't quite as good as we remember. I mean, certainly there were probably some good things about it, but time has a way of eroding the rough, the rough edges off of the past. And so what we tend to do is we I tend to idealize it. But you know what? There actually was a good day or a good old days. And it wasn't during my childhood or your childhood. It wasn't during any of our lifetimes. It was all the way back to the very beginning. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Today, we're continuing our sermon series called Eden, and we're looking at the events of Genesis chapter 2 that focus on the Garden of Eden. So when we talk about the good old days, uh, there might have been some good days in our past, but really, they truly, even those good days pale in, compar in comparison to the good old days back in the Garden. 
Our text today is Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. And uh, these verses are going to give us a picture of what those good old days were like. But it's also going to give us a way forward to how we should live in these days now and in the days ahead. Our our text starts in verse 8. It says this. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. So in the verses leading up to this last week, uh, we saw that God was acting like a potter. Remember, we, we, we saw that God took dirt and he formed it and he, make, and he made man. And we kind of speculated that maybe God took some water from the stream and mixed that with the dirt and made mud. But regardless, he's, he's working like a potter to create man. And that was last week in the previous verses. But in these verses here this week, God isn't like a potter. He's like a gardener. Now, we should probably clarify that the kind of garden being talked about here isn't the kind of garden that you might have like in your backyard. When we moved into our house, there was a little garden area. It had some wood walls around it. It was elevated a little bit. And I don't even know what they planted in there, but you might have like, you know, tomatoes or cabbage or lettuce or I don't know what it is you, but this is not that kind of a garden in nice, neat rows. The kind of garden we're talking about here is more like an arboretum or a botanical garden or like a nature park. It's all sorts of trees and vegetation here. And God makes this garden right after he created man. So we see that this garden is specifically for man. And as we see in the next verses here, this is a place of beauty and provision. Verse 9 continues. It says, The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. So this is an ideal environment here. God's taking care of the details. He's causing these trees to grow. Uh, Man doesn't have to worry about anything. And he's got this great view. It says that these trees were pleasing to the eye. They're beautiful. This is the kind of place that if you're going to go and kind of relax and just enjoy the scenery, this is the place to do that. These trees are beautiful. And these trees are providing really good food as well. You know, sometimes, you know, healthy food doesn't taste so well. I imagine the food in the garden to not only taste good, but be actually healthy for you as well. This is a good environment. Now, in the ancient world, kings would often build elaborate gardens like this. And they would fill these gardens with exotic plants and trees and animals because this was a way for them to be able to show off their wealth and their power. And because of that, these gardens that these ancient kings would build, they were often near their palaces or they were often near temples. Now, this garden has been created not by a human king, but by the king of creation. And so these verses here aren't just telling us about some sort of paradise, some sort of utopia here. This is a sacred space where God wants to meet with people. Verse 9 continues, and it says, In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what I want to do is I want us to just step back and just observe what we have just read in the last couple of verses. We're told that God planted a garden in the east. So we want to start broadly in the east, and we see that the first area that's being talked about is in the east. And then we are told that the garden was located in Eden. So Eden is an area And that garden then is located inside of it. And in the center of that garden are two trees. So the narrative is working like a funnel. It's starting broadly and it's becoming more specific. East, Eden, garden, two trees right at the center. That's communicating something to us. And we're going to come back to that a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Let's just notice here for a second. What is not in the middle of the garden? Man, man is not in the middle of the garden. And all the women said, oh, come on, come on. I thought we would get like, there was one over here, but you were excited. Whoever that was, it was Lori. Oh yes, it was Lori Palmer, of course. (laughs) Sorry, Josh. So uh, man is not, but here's the deal. Sorry, I kind of tricked you. Eve wasn't, wasn't created yet. So women aren't there either. But the point is, is humans are not, we have a tendency, don't we? To kind of put ourselves at the center of things. But here we don't have, Humans at the center. At the center, we have these trees. We have two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what is the source of life? And what is the source of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, these trees are, as these verses tell us, but really, more specifically, it's God. So the center of this garden is an important location for connecting with the divine. 
It's, it's a place to get knowledge and to get life. And we're going to talk about these trees a little bit more next week. But in the meantime, these next few verses here, they're going to take us on a little bit of a rabbit trail. Um, when you read through Genesis 2 here, this next couple of verses, they kind of seem like they're just there. It doesn't make sense. It's like these kind of little uh, scholars call this a parenthetical section. Like it's, a, it's just kind of an aside that's here. But we're going to look at this because this is telling us something about the garden here. Verse 10. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it was separated into four headwaters. So if you remember last week, the text told us that there was no rain yet on the earth. Instead, these streams came up from the ground and it watered the land. So here we have a river here in Eden that's coming up, presumably from the ground, like we were told in the previous verses. And this river that's coming up is significant enough to not only water the Garden of Eden, which is pretty exceptional and impressive on its own, but it's now not just watering Eden, this garden, but it's also uh, resulting in four different rivers coming out of it. Now, let's just make an observation that we just know about rivers and things. When it comes to rivers, which way do rivers flow? We say that they flow downstream. And what do we mean by that? Well, we mean that there's elevation and gravity, right? There's, it starts high and it goes low. And now some rivers are going to be, you know, more at an angle. Some aren't going to be quite as much, but it goes downstream. Uh, so this here is a subtle clue that, um, that, th- that this verse is telling us and other verses are telling us that Eden is on a high place. That Eden is elevated above the, this garden here is elevated from the other areas. And this idea is expressed uh, throughout the, uh, the scriptures. In fact, in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 13 through 14, it talks about Eden. The prophet is talking about Eden. And then he says this in verse 14. He describes Eden as being on the holy mount of God. So for the later biblical writers, when they look back at Eden, they see Eden as being this high garden, uh, this high place. Um, And this is why mountains are significant throughout the Old Testament. Have you ever noticed that? Like uh, you've got the prophets of Baal and Elijah, and that happens on a mountain. You've got the giving of the law on a mountain. Even in the New Testament, you have Jesus and his transfiguration happens on a mountain. Mountains are significant. Uh, We're reading through the Bible together as a church. And if you're a part of that reading plan, we've been reading uh, the stories of the different kings. And you'll read about some of these kings that were leading the people in pagan practices. And it talks about tearing down the altars on the high places. And that's what's being talked about here. This is an elevated place here. And so the picture that the Bible presents us is that Eden is this high mountain garden with these four streams leading out of it continues now and tells us about these four streams. Verse 11, the name of the first is Pashon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. Uh, The name of the second river is Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, throughout history, people have tried to to discover the location of the Garden of Eden based on these rivers. But the bottom line is, we just don't know. Um, We can only, in fact, identify two of these rivers, uh, the Tigris and the Euphrates. We know where those are located, but the other two, Pishon and Gihon, they they remain unknown to us. And on top of that, I mean, the reality is, is that landscape can change, can't it? Rivers can dry up, rivers can change course, and natural disasters like, I don't know, a flood could change the terrain as well. So if you've got the uh, Church Center app on your phone, our church has an app, it's called Church Center. If you have that app and you go to the sermon notes area, there is a ton of scholars that I've copied and pasted there. You can look at all their different musings and thoughts about where they think the Garden of uh, Eden might have been located based on these rivers. But with that said, these rivers are given a little bit of a description for us. Each of these rivers identify, or can be identified in a different area and with different people groups. So Pashan runs through the land of Havilah, and we know today that this is south and east of Canaan. So this is where the Canaanites lived, the Ishmaelites, and the Edomites. Gihon is the, the second river. It runs through the land of Cush, which is uh, the area of Egypt, uh, like southern Egypt. Uh, the Tigris River runs uh, through uh, Assyria. And the the Euphrates is in the Babylonian floodplains. So 
Do any of those places and names sound familiar to you? If you've read through the Old Testament, they should, because these rivers are located in regions or they flow through regions where essentially the whole story of the Old Testament takes place. So right here in the garden, we have this picture of Eden being the source of provision and blessing for all of the surrounding areas. And it's not just bringing water to these different regions. It's bringing rich resources and blessings. Remember the descriptions that we read. These rivers uh, bring result in gold and precious materials. It's as if goodness is just emanating from Eden. Uh, There's a scholar, John Walton. We've quoted him before, but he illustrates what's happening here with this phrase. uh, All roads lead to Rome. I'm sure probably you're familiar with this expression. Um, The idea is in the height of the Roman Empire that uh, all these roads led to Rome. But this expression doesn't mean that if you had a map of all the roads in Rome at the height of the Roman Empire, that every single road literally was pointing directly to Rome. That's That's not what this expression means. What, what it means is, is that Rome was so important, it was so, such an important central location, and the road system was so good that essentially, pretty much, most roads would get you there. You get on a road, eventually you're going to find your way to Rome. It wasn't that everything was uh, directly pointing there. And so the uh, scholar here, John Walton, he continues, he says, this location of Eden in reference to the Tigris and the Euphrates, it's the same kind of statement. He says, its location is not given so that it can be found, but so that its strategic role can be appreciated. All fertility emanates from the presence of God. You see, regardless of the actual location, uh, the author wants us to recognize that God's presence is the source of blessing. This, this provision that God made, it was for Adam, and Adam was in the garden, garden, but that blessing wasn't supposed to be contained in the garden. It flowed out to all the surrounding regions. Life comes from God. The blessing of Eden was never intended to stay in Eden. And now this leads us back to where our text started. Let's look at verse 15. It says this, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Now, this verse is very similar to the first verse that we looked at today. So we're going to leave verse 15 up, and then I'm going to read verse 8 to you. It says this, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. We've talked about this. Uh, Hebrew literature uses repetition. And so we have a little repetition here. We've got this uh, first verse here in uh, verse 8, and then we have verse 15, and we got this little like aside in the middle. So these are like little bookends to what's happening here. And what we see in verse 8 is God is working to create a garden, and then he puts man in it. But then in verse 15, God puts man in this garden, but then it's not God's work, but it's man's work that's discussed. So the putting of man is the same. In verse 8, God is working to create the garden. In verse 15, man has a a responsibility. He has work to do. So notice here, work is is not a product of God's curse on man. Work is is a part of God's calling for man. You see the difference here. I know we don't like our jobs sometimes. We don't like work. But work is not a part of the curse. This is happening before Adam and Eve failed in the garden. This is part of God's calling for humans. Work in itself is not inherently bad. Uh, Adam was given a responsibility here in the garden. So what was that responsibility? Well, there are two words that are used to describe what Adam is to do. He is to work and he is to care or take care. Uh, In verse 15, these two words that show up up here, these come from two Hebrew words. And these Hebrew words have a, a, a wide range of meaning. And these words can be used to talk about doing agricultural tasks in a garden. Just like we kind of at, a, at the surface level, we read this, looks like he's got to do some caring of plants and things. And these words can work that way. However, these words are very, very often, if not mostly used throughout the Old Testament, not in that way at all. They are instead extensively used to describe the actions of a priest, someone who is serving on behalf of, uh, uh, of God in heaven. So they describe the work that is done in service to God. In other words, this is, this is like priestly language that's showing up here in the Garden of Eden. Adam is put in the garden to serve as a priest in God's garden temple. Now, God's done all the heavy lifting 
uh, he's created the garden. He's set it all up. There's a source of water to provide life. The, the trees produce fruit. They continue to pr- produce fruit. fruit. The food is unending there. And Adam's responsibility is to foster it and to cultivate all of this so that it continues to provide life. But not only for the good of the garden, but also for the good of the surrounding regions, because the blessing of Eden was never intended to stay in Eden. So let's go back to that diagram that we showed here. We've got the east and we've got Eden and the garden and two trees. Can you think of any other places in the Bible where we have a similar pattern of working outside and working our way into a center or into a focus point in the middle? Sure, we do. We've, we've got this. This is the tabernacle and the temple. If you remember, the tabernacle was a tent where the Israelites would meet with God, offer their sacrifices. When they were wandering in the desert, it was mobile. But then when they got into the land, they built the temple that was stationary. And so what we have here is we have this little diagram of, of Eden, but we also can see this as it relates to the tabernacle and the temple as well. Let's show that here. We have the land of Israel. And then what happened is you would get up to uh, the site and there was the courtyard and then there was the holy place. But then in the middle was the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, which represented God's presence there. This is not by accident. Uh, The people, the, 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 the development of the tabernacle and the temple were intended to mirror and look back to the Garden of Eden. Now, here's a drawing I have come across. It's an older drawing. It's not a great, it's kind of busy. But this is, I think, really helpful for us to see what's happening here. On the left side, we have this image of the Garden of Eden. We've got the streams coming out at the front of the entrance here. And then we have two cherubim with a flaming sword. It's kind of a spoiler alert, but after Adam and Eve fail and they sin in the garden, uh, they're banished. And then we're told that cherubim came and were guarding the entrance. And then after that, we have a tree. This, this particular picture has the tree of knowledge of good and evil and then the tree of life at the end. Now, if you shift over to the side here for the tabernacle or the temple, what happens is you walk up. You see this thing, it says the bronze laver. That's, that's like a King James uh, term. Uh, this is an older drawing here. But the bronze laver in some of the modern translations is the bronze basin. This is like a big bowl filled with water. In fact, it's called the sea so think about the Garden of Eden being this place where water is, is coming out, providing life. And, and, and then here you are walking up and you see this big water <laughs> uh, reservoir here. It's reminding you of Eden. And as you come up, there's a veil that cherubim have been um, p- painted on it to in- indicate what's happening in the garden. And then you go inside the holy place and what's in the holy place? You can kind of see it there. There's a menorah. It's this, it's this light, it's this lampstand that looks like a tree. <laughs> this, is, this is Eden garden stuff. Next to that, there is a table, uh, the table of showbread where they would put fresh bread every single day. Eternal food, always there, always present, just like the garden. And then, by the way, the things that they use to make the tabernacle and the temple, the precious stones, those are the same kinds of stones that are described in the verses that we looked at with the rivers that go out, onyx, and we don't even know what some of those things are that are mentioned there. But these are the descriptions here. And of course, you get into the Holy of Holies, where God's presence is. He is at the the center of it. So I show this to point out that everything in these verses is going to show up again. These verses here in Genesis, they're going to show up again with the creation of the tabernacle and the temple. They are symbolically recreating Eden. And so the idea is, is that when the priest went into the temple on behalf of the people, he was working to restore everything to the good old days of Eden. So here we are in Genesis 2, and Adam is in a state of harmony He's in a state of unity in his relationship with God. He's in the good old days. But this doesn't last long. Just turn the page. Or if you're on your Bible app, just swipe up a little bit. And the next, right right after this, Adam and Eve, they fail. They sin. They take from the tree that God told them not to take from. They disobey God. And the result of that is death and exile, and they're cast out of the garden. And as a result, now all of us, we are in this state, in this world, where we're like, oh, we need to get back to the good old days. We know, we know we're not in Eden anymore. We're, we're not in this place of provision. And this, we have glimmers of this when we experience God's presence in a worship service, or maybe in a time of prayer on our own. We have these moments where we feel like we're connecting with God and the divine in a really powerful way. But we know it's just not like how it's supposed to be and how it was in Eden. 
And the story of the scripture after this point is a story about working our way back to God, trying to restore this broken relationship. That's what the law was all about. When God gave the law to Moses, it was his way of saying, these are the things that you need to do to be able to be in right relationship with me. The temple system was about restoring relationship with God through sacrifice. All throughout the Old Testament, the temple was the location that they had to go to meet with God. When it was the tabernacle, they all moved around with it and they camped around it. But when they entered into the land, they spread out. And then they had to go to the temple to find forgiveness of their sins, to offer these sacrifices. And it was, it, they, it was their way of connecting with the good old days, going back to Eden. And that's how it was until Jesus came. In John chapter 1, verse 14, uh, John tells us that Jesus dwelt among us. But John does something really cool here with that word dwelt. He takes a noun and he makes it a verb. And he says, Jesus tented with us. He tabernacled with us. He takes this noun and he says, it's, I want to show you something here about Jesus. What he's saying is he's saying that Jesus is like a mobile temple. He's like the tabernacle that would go around. He's saying that Jesus is the place where heaven and earth overlap. Just like when they would go to the temple and that was the one location in the Holy of Holies where God's presence would overlap with human space. The, what, what John is saying is that when Jesus showed up, that all changed. Jesus was the point where heaven and earth overlapped. And when he went around, what he did is he brought little pockets of Eden. He brought around the tabernacle experience. He healed the sick. He forgave sins. He declared the kingdom of heaven that it had arrived. And on his death at the, on, on the cross, Jesus, what he does is he passes the test that Adam and Eve failed to pass in the garden. Adam and Eve, what did they do? They took from the tree in order to serve themselves. But on the tree, on the cross of Calvary, Jesus gave in order to serve everyone else. See, now that Jesus has made this ultimate sacrifice, the scriptures teach us that those who believe in him, that we have been made into a new creation. That all of a sudden, just like Adam in the garden, all of a sudden now we are given a purpose and we are given a responsibility. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9 Peter writes to a church that was enduring great persecution. And he says, but you, church, you are a chosen people. The world may reject you right now. The, the world may be attacking you. The world may be violent against you. But I'm telling you, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Why? So you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. See, Adam's original responsibility of being a priest in the Garden of Eden, this garden temple, has now, church, been passed on to us, those of us who would make Jesus our Savior and Lord and follow after him. And today now, church, we are his representatives. We are his royal priesthood. And we have a calling now to work and to take care of this message, a priestly duty that we have. Not everyone is called to full-time vocational ministry, but all of us are called to do the ministry that's being discussed here. We are all priests. We are all to declare the praises of him because we're not at the center of the garden. He is. Jesus is at the center and it's our job to serve him. We then now are to go out into this world creating little pockets of Eden everywhere we go. We are to bring the blessings of Eden to everyone we meet because the blessing of Eden was never intended to stay in Eden. And so what God does in us, in this place certainly, or in your life through your daily devotional time was never intended to be kept there. It was always intended. The blessing of Eden is always intended to be given out. And it's not even intended to stay in Eden itself because the end of the book continues and I want to read just a few verses from Revelation chapter 22 here, verses one through around five. And I want you to listen for the Eden language that's found here, the, the Genesis one and two language. It says this, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. So we don't have a garden anymore, but now we have a city, but it's coming out of the middle of it. On each side of the river stood the tree of life. Now, I don't know how a tree stands on both sides of the river, but that's the description here. Both sides um, stood the, the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, 
yielding its fruit every month, provision of food. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. It's not just for that. It's, it's intended to go out. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. There will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. We are a royal priesthood and we look for the day. We look for the day when that new heaven, that new city will be created and we will dwell with him. But in the meantime, we don't lament those, those days that, that, we, that we've walked through, but we look to the good day, the day that we can bring right here and right now. We can say, oh, the good old days when I was younger, oh, the good old days, but really what we should be saying is the good days of Eden. How can I bring Eden into uh, my circumstances today? Because the blessings of Eden were never intended to stay there. It was intended to go to the new creation and it was intended not to be kept by us, it's intended for us to, be, to declare it and to be announced to everyone we meet. Church, we as a church, we have to understand and recognize that our calling is not unto ourselves, but it is for the world around us. I have, I, I'm so, I, I just, I've said this over the years. I believe that Cornerstone Church is here for a reason. I, we, it's just not random happenstance that we ended up here. I believe God wants each one of us not just simply here uh, during a service. Oh, that's a great time for it to happen. But through your lives, as you go out as priests on behalf of him announcing, hey, this is what Jesus has done for me. As you do that, I believe the river bend area will be transformed. Just like those rivers went out, I believe the river bend area can be transformed. And so church, that's our calling in today. How are you bringing the blessing of Eden to the world around you? I mean, certainly you need to experience it for yourself. If you're far from him today, there is a blessing of life and, not, and knowing God that you can experience today by putting your trust in him. But if you've been at this for a while and you're keeping this for yourself, that's a problem. You are not fulfilling the mandate that God has given to you. Adam may have taken from a tree and he may have, uh, and Eve may have taken from that tree, but what we're doing is we're holding the extra fruit that we should be giving to the world around us. And neither one is better or worse than the other. Both of us, if that's the case, we're failing if we aren't giving this out to the world around us. And so church, let's be people that receive this Eden blessing, but then pass this Eden blessing on to the world around us. Let's pray. Father, we put our trust in you and we recognize that, yeah, there were some good days in our past, but the real good days, the days of Eden, God, you want to restore and you want to use us to bring pockets of good, goodness in Eden to the world around us. And so, Father, I pray that we would be just like Jesus, little uh, expressions of Eden wherever we go, bringing healing and life and encouragement and hope to all the people that we meet and to everywhere we go. Father, we need you to do a work in us. We need you to, to change us. Sometimes we get focused on ourselves or we become selfish or we become distracted. We want to have a renewed sense of what it is that you're calling us to do. Father, I pray for those who feel far from you. Maybe they feel like uh, they have done so many things that have just kept them apart from you. Father, I pray right now that if there's anyone here that feels as though that they are far from you, God, I pray that they would call out to you and they would reach out to you and accept this great Eden gift of life and provision and healing that's available to them because of Jesus' work on the cross. We put our trust in you today. We ask you to help us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? I'm going to ask our worship team to lead us in one final song. And I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward. If you need to be prayed for, for anything, could be about the message, could just be about a life circumstance, our prayer team's going to come forward. They have lanyards. They'll be up on the front here. Just keep an eye out for them. Um, I'm going to ask you to just come forward if you need prayer. And then if you're here and you just say, man, Pastor, I just want to spend some time praying. I just want to respond to this. Maybe, maybe you just need to say, oh God, I need to experience a little bit of Eden today. I need some encouragement. I need some life. Maybe you just want to spend some time. You can come up and I encourage you to come up and spend some time on the stairs, uh, praying here, kneeling. But church, let's sing this final song about building our life. And let's make sure that we are truly building our life on the right foundation so that we have an Eden blessing to share with the world around us. Worship team, would you lead us? Let's come, let's respond and pray. song we could ever sing. He 
He's worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We sing holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those
I, I just believe that um, the Lord's got something more that he wants us to accomplish as a church in reaching out into the community around us. Um, it's, it's been on my heart over the last several weeks, just this, um, this re- recognition, church, that we need to be fully aware. I mean, I, I think we already are aware of the brokenness around us, but what we need to be aware of is that God wants to use us to do something about it. That, that we are his priests and, and we are to care and cultivate and spread this blessing. We, not just me. I mean, I'm a pastor. I do my part. I do my role. But you, there are people that you know that I'll never, never have in, any contact with. I mean, they may show up to churches sometime if you invite them. But that takes you inviting them. It takes you investing in the relationship. And so, church, let's be the kind of people that, man, let's, let's be people that experience the Eden blessing. But let's be people that share that with everybody around us and everywhere we go. Tonight, uh, today, I want to just, we're going to c- conclude a little differently today. I'm going to invite the Weissmans to come on up. They're going to stand in the front. First service, they came up here, but I think uh, we're going to have them on the, the, the floor here. Uh, pastor Jake has been our, and Taylor, they've been our youth pastors here for four, four and a half years. And today's their last Sunday. Um, they're going to make a... Uh, uh, transition up north to LaGrange and they're going to be uh, youth pastors at a church up there and we want to pray for them and so I thought it'd be kind of cool I know their youth are in the front here but anybody that wants to just kind of gather around and you know reach out and you know pray for them and you know put a hand on their shoulder I just want to invite you to come just come on right now yeah you don't have to stop keep coming whoever wants to come uh, our staff any of our board members any family you know uh, uh, family members that are here or parents of kids um we're grateful for the Weissmans. We love the Weissmans. And what we want to do is just pray a prayer of blessing as they make this transition. So would you join with me in a word of prayer? Father, we lift up the Weissmans. Oh God, we're grateful for friendship. We're grateful for ministry. We're grateful for the investment over the years. Father, we know that you have provided for them in the midst of this transition through finding a place to stay and selling their house and you've opened up the avenues and so father we pray that you would continue to provide for them as they move into this uh, new ministry assignment into this new stage of life and calling father we pray that your favor would go before them we pray for greater days of ministry we pray that you would give them a strong a relationship with the people that they're um, going to be ministering to so that they can be effective Father, I pray that uh, you would provide all that they need through all the stress, all the challenges, all the, the changes and the shifting that goes on with a move like this. Father, we pray that you would go before them and we pray that your spirit would anoint them and that they would accomplish even greater things than, than, than they could hope or imagine, God, and that you would use them powerfully. God bless them, we pray. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. We've got a, um, they'll be around. They're going to have to like leave at some point, but say hello. If you want to give a, an expression of thanks to them, we have a little card area um, uh, out in the foyer. There's a little uh, basket you can put something in to say thank you, but um, we're grateful for them. So take a minute, say hello or say goodbye. And um, let's just end this way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Uh, We'll see you on Wednesday for our men's and women's meetings. The men will be in here. Women will be upstairs. God bless. Have a great rest of the day. Say hello. Uh, Greet the the Weissmans. Take care. God bless.